Paul, have I ever told you that every morning I have to pee at 5 a.m.? <laughs> Matt, it's, it's never come up. Yeah, Paul, the problem is I don't wake up until around 5.30. Great stuff. Yeah. Matt, <laughs> <laughs> I, I really hate typos, like a lot. Okay, I mean, who doesn't? You mix up two letters and your whole post is urined. <laughs> <laughs> well done, guys. <laughs> The Curbsiders Podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. Furthermore, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of the host and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash like more hospital and affiliate outreach programs, if indeed there are any. In fact, there are none. Pretty much, we are responsible if you screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know when we're wrong. Welcome back to The Curbsiders. I'm Dr. Matthew Frank Watto, here with... My great friend and America's primary care physician, Dr. Paul Nelson Williams. Hi, Paul. Hi. I feel like Hi Paul's a classic. Hi, Matt. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing well. This is a great episode that people are about to hear on recurrent urinary tract infections with guest Dr. Kellen Choi. Paul, before we introduce our co-host and our guest uh, speaker, would you tell people what what exactly do we do on curbsiders? Sure, Matt. As a reminder to everyone, we are the Internal Medicine Podcast. We use expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. And I'm going to introduce our producer for the episode and frequent co-host, uh, Isabel Valdez, who put this whole thing together. Isabel, how are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. How are you guys? Great. And thank you for producing this episode. This is one that I wanted to do for a long time because it's not, I wouldn't say I have a ton of patients suffering from this issue, but it certainly when you have patients suffering with like recurrent UTIs, recurrent urinary symptoms, it's an issue. So I was glad to have this framework uh, that Dr. Choi gave us. So, yes, I think everyone's going to really enjoy our conversation tonight with a very dynamic Dr. Kellen Choi. Uh, I guess that's kind of a pun right there. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, Dr. Choi is a urologist, a practicing urologist at the faculty group at the University of Louisville. And her main area in, of interest are uh, complex voiding dysfunction, female urology, which we're going to get into today, general male urology, and robotic surgery. In fact, uh, she's uh, really excited about her receiving a center of excellence designation for a bladder pacemaker. Uh, Dr. Choi earned her MD from the University of North Texas College of Osteopathic Medicine. She completed her fellowship in female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery at Metro Urology Center and Continence Care. And her residency in urology was from Charleston Area Medical Center in Charleston, West Virginia. This was a very appropriate name for her. The, her daughter dubbed her the bladder teacher. And uh, I really do feel that today we got schooled, you guys. I think so it was great because we learned not just about urinary tract infections, um, the importance of pooping, drinking lots of fluids. So she was a great teacher altogether. So I'm excited about tonight. And we, of course, have to thank her husband, who is a pulmonologist who convinced her to do the show. That's uh, Dr. Alex Ng. So thank you for, for that, uh, Dr. Ng, for convincing her to do the show. And I should remind the audience that this and most episodes are available for CME for all health professionals through VCU Health at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. And also, if you haven't done so yet, you really need to check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash curbsiders where you can get access to the Cashlack Vault, which has all PDFs of all our show notes, all our figures for over 400 plus episodes. Plus you can get twice monthly bonus episodes and ad free episodes, a whole bunch of other cool stuff. So check it out, patreon.com slash curbsiders. Kellen, we've been talking for a while. Very excited to talk to you about this topic of recurrent urinary tract infections. But first, the audience, you know, they've heard your bio, but they're going to want to hear what's a hobby or interest that you have outside of medicine? Yes. Oh, music is one of my favorite things. So I've been playing piano since I was little. I was in orchestra. I was even in a band, you know, it was church band, but it still sounds cool when I say it. I was in a band, <laughs> right? So you see a digital piano. I don't know if you can see it. And we have a grand piano downstairs, but I even like rearranged all my CD. I still listen to CD. So those are BTS, okay? <laughs> so in case I have a BTS army fans, there's all those cities there. <laughs> so when they come back from military next year, not, I'm very counting, but 2025, I would love to go to their concert. So that's music is my life. 
<laughs> Wait, I, I just want to make sure I'm clear on thing. And obviously, not everyone's gonna be able to see this, but just are you saying all those CDs behind you are BTS CDs? I just want to make I sure know. I'm understanding what's happening. <laughs> you are correctly understanding. You only see <laughs> half of it. And I'm like a late bloomer. They've been around for ten years, but like five years ago, I just fell in love. I was I had my second baby, and you know, I was watching TV, and I'm like, oh my gosh, who are these? <laughs> <laughs> so that was my my child is almost like four so it's been four or five years but yeah too bad they had to all serve in the military so i was born in korea so i understand the nuances but all bo body able men they have to go to military so uh yeah as i became a fan and pandemic even if happened, you're billionaires yeah. or whatever <laughs> yeah it doesn't matter you're supposed to go so they all went to military and they're peak I of their no idea. Yeah, I know. Now more you know. I know we're here to talk about UTI, but since you asked, I'm going to deliver, right? <laughs> Fascinating. I did not know that either. <laughs> Paul, is, is that your question or do you have any anything else <laughs> yeah. you want to know? I, I could talk about this for the rest of the night, but let me um, let me ask instead. We, we like to ask about a favorite failure, um, and it doesn't have to necessarily be medical failure, but just was there... What is a yes. failure that taught you something? Oh, it was really bad. So I, I've been playing piano, like I said, since I was six. And uh, in, in Korea, we were playing piano one hour every day after school for five days a week. So we're all serious, right? So I think I was in like first or second grade. I could finally play some Mozart, right? But my teacher, instead of playing like a basic song for the, the competition, she wanted me to do a little more advanced for my age. So I practiced, practiced, fine. But the problem is the day of the actual competition, the piano looked really different. So I forgot where the middle C, the middle part to play. Because the teacher taught me, just look at your belly button. Where the keyhole is, where your <laughs> belly button. Well, the problem with this grand piano did not have the keyhole. So I sit there, I'm like, oh my gosh. I've been practicing for months. I know the tune. Is it here? Is it middle? Is it the low? So I'm like messed up. So I play like low. I'm like, oh, that's way too low. And I play high. Oh, I'm definitely not going to get any award. Do I just bail out and cry? Because I'm first grader. I like socially acceptable <laughs> behavior. Or I just power it through. And I'm like, you know what? I'm already here. Let's just play. See what happens. So I play. And it was miserable, but I played. And uh, to this day, my daughter who's six, she plays piano. I tell them my failure story. Like, hey, Lily, did I give up? Or I just play even though I didn't get any award. She's like, you can't playing and she's like okay there you go nothing to worry about and i survived <laughs> <laughs> yeah i hope you gave it to your teacher after that like thanks a lot <laughs> now, you know teach. right <laughs> i don't even know what she's doing these days but i hope you're happy <laughs> <laughs> and uh isabel would you read our first case Absolutely. So we have um, we have Melanie is a 33 year old female that is otherwise healthy and presents to the clinic with three days of dysuria and urinary frequency. She occasionally feels a sense of urgency to urinate and mild lower abdominal cramping. She denies fevers, chills, nausea, vomiting, hematuria, and back pain. Her last menses was about eight to nine days ago. She reports she had similar symptoms about six weeks ago and was treated at urgent care with some antibiotics. And we did an in-house uh, um, in-clinic urine analysis that showed three plus leukocytes, positive nitrites, and three plus hematuria. So it sounds, sounds like something all of us have seen before. Uh, so when you see this, um, what can you kind of uh, help us understand what qualifies this patient? I mean, she had similar symptoms before. She has symptoms now. Is this enough to qualify her as a recurrent UTI patient? Uh, or what are some of the standards, some of the things that we should be looking out for? Great question. So this will be what we call, um, according to our guidelines for Urologic Association AUA, the index patient. So pretty straightforward. She doesn't have any kind of immunocompromised state or anatomical reason to keep have a UTI. And technically, I know she went to urgent care, but till I've seen multiple culture positive UTI, I don't tend to label recurring UTI. More than not, I'm telling patients, they tell me I have UTI all the time that it's really not a UTI or it's not recurrent. So to be really qualified for recurring UTI, patients need to have a culture-specific positive three UTI in one year or two in six months. So a lot of people right off the bat don't even qualify because the numbering. Or maybe they thought they were treated, but it was a wrong antibody because, you know, they just assumed that it was UTI and the culture wasn't sent. That was actually one of pain point and peeve. Because if you don't know what you're treating, you're contributing more to the resistance. So the fact that she went to urgent care makes me a little anxious that she may be 
not following up with the culture. So I, I prefer that she sees consistent person. You know, I know primary doctors are working really hard and very busy, but someone who can like kind of consistently at least have a track of urine culture to see is this truly a UTI? Because if they're all of a sudden were fine and one year have six UTI one year, maybe something happened, right? So um, vaginal estrogen cream, we talk about later on, but if there's any recent UTI, honeymoon cystitis, or if the patients are not drinking water as much as they used to because of some kind of job changes, I've seen literally a patient who are not able to go to the bathroom on time because their new job bathroom is far away. So they cannot pee as much because it's far away. So they drink less and then they're getting UTI. So you'll be surprised how many random life events that I can pinpoint like, oh, you have a new job. The bathroom is far, you know? So I, I talk to my patients so much. I even talk about their dog because sometimes the reason they get up in the middle of the night is because dog is barking and they got to go to pee. That's not really nocturia. It's your dog <laughs> needs to sleep more, right? <laughs> so my, my point is a lot of time, like I really talk to my patient and like, I even make my new patient visit really long on purpose so I can get the most information because the more time I spend on that first visit, I get the most out of it. And as a urologist, I tell my patients like my idealistic role, like I don't want to be like seen as this impossible saver that's going to cure all their UTI and all their problems. I, I, I just can't. But as a urologic surgeon, I will assure you, you don't have this gigantic stack horn, you know, calculus that's going to compromise your renal function or you have a bladder cancer or you have some kind of foreign body in your bladder, severe prolapse. So I'm here to rule out any kind of concerning structural issues, not here to necessarily treat every single UTI. In fact, asymptomatic bacteria does not even need to be treated unless you're pregnant or getting urologic surgery. So from the beginning, I make their expectation kind of clear and kind of low. That like, I'm not the cure all be all saver. Like nobody is, right? Mm -hmm. But I try to empower my patients. So I don't know if you, it's not a Stanley, it's just good old water bottle. <laughs> with, yeah, I like, I like Belle, you know, she's Yeah, inspiring. that's Disney, Belle, Disney, sticker. and then BTS again. But I cannot go like, it's like circling back. <laughs> but my point is I drink a lot of water. So I, I bring this to my white coat. I'm like, if your surgeon between crazy cases, busy day can drink water, you can do it too. And I like call them out. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, I think this came up when we were on our, um, our kidney stone episode, our guest was talking about how some of his patients, it was really a challenge for them to drink enough water because yes. certain jobs, like right. you're a security guard, you only get so many bathroom yes. breaks, something like that. So, yeah, but I really appreciate, uh, the what you said about the nocturia and, and the I have a cat so now oh, yes. I'm a wo I'm a woman of a certain age so now I know I don't have nocturia um <laughs> but uh, uh thank you but the uh, but one of the things you mentioned right now is got it's got to be culture specific um because I I feel and and guys correct me if I'm wrong I feel like we've been told you don't have to culture everything every uh, bladder or symptom patient that comes in yeah, that's a good question. So, you know, a young woman calls with just a, a UTI and it's it's the one that they've had. The last one was a couple years ago and it's pretty classic symptoms. We can treat them and not send any urinalysis or culture. That's pretty standard practice in primary care. I think maybe what makes this case we presented different with Melanie is that she just had one six weeks ago. So something, when it's recurring that quickly, something should maybe trip in us that says we need to send another one. Yeah, great question. So if the patient never had UTI for years and that one time they remember it was culture positive and they knew what antibody worked for them and it was specific E. coli sensitive to everything. In that case, patient is so self-aware. It's not all the time. So I think case by case, if she's like traveling far away and she needs that one antibody, I think that's okay. What I'm more uh, concerned about is patients with like pelvic floor dysfunction or some other painful bladder syndrome or other condition, and they just blame the bladder and they get so many antibiotics from so many, you know, clinicians and then get multi-resistant, you know, mm -hmm. bacteria. So that's my concern. But I think we know our patients really well too. So sometimes it could be even anxiety. I totally get it. Like they're so anxious to get a UTI or the thought of it. So it's almost like, is this really a UTI or it's like, overactive bladder symptom with burning and everything else and you know but um it is tough i think recurring uti is very very challenging for everybody especially for the patients but once again reassurance of 
nothing concerning, crazy is happening. But, you know, if you really clearly think one time UTI for that one patient, I think is totally um, reasonable that you mentioned. Now, um, I have had a couple of patients, especially during the pandemic, because they couldn't get into clinic or whatnot. They started to use those home tests. Right. Um, and, uh, and they're like, they would send me a picture of it on, right. on, on my, uh, I was about to say the name in my electronic medical record and, and my port, the patient portal, like, this is what I have. It's pink. I need a bladder. So are those reliable? Is that something that you'd say you could rely on them in, for some patients? I think it could be like double edged sword, but I think sometimes patients can potentially be obsessed with it and it can be such a non-specific test that they can pick up on so many things that they are going to be even more concerned and anxious about it. So I'm not a huge fan. And, um, you know, urine culture probably will be best fit. And even then, a lot of them could be contamination. So really, the most accurate way be would be the straight cat. But it's so uncomfortable, right? So when I offer that to, for the most accurate culture, a lot of people are like, oh, I'm okay. <laughs> maybe it's not my UTI. Yeah. <laughs> Well, maybe we could step back. Paul, Paul's a big physical exam nerd, but this seems like a topic where there should be some things that we should look for on exam. So you mentioned some of your differential pelvic organ prolapse. And uh, can you talk to us about like what minimal physical exam should the primary care doctors do? Right. So in a perfect world, um, especially as a urologist, I know we're talking about primary care setting too. But pelvic exam is so important. In fact, our guideline also talks about the importance of pelvic exam and physical exam. So if you're able to get a chaperone and patient are, um, you know, feeling safe. And sometimes I have to do pelvic exam on the next visit because patients are not mentally prepared. Like, what do you mean by you're going to do pelvic exam, right? So if you, I know everybody's super busy, but if you can kind of set the tone, like uh, this time we're kind of meet and greet, we'll get to know each other, but I really do need to do a pelvic exam. If you can do on the same visit, a lot of urologists, we just do on the same visit. But if you're able to at least set the tone, mentally prepare them so they can do pelvic exam. I found patients who thought they had just had a UTI with a large prolapse after, um, you know, I do robotic sacrocopovexy and she absolutely got a hysterectomy. So we did a combo case. But after her prolapse was fixed, her UTI fixed because she's now emptying completely and her bladder pain and a lot of her dysuria and all that got better too. So I cannot emphasize the importance of a proper pelvic exam. You know, you find, you know, cancer that way sometimes. Some of the ladies haven't seen gyne in a long time. So when we do pelvic exam, you'll be surprised. A lot of various findings. Um, I've seen a diverticulum on the urethra, a bladder stones. If they're not emptying completely, of course, bladder stone, you won't find. It'll be through a cystoscopy or some kind of other imaging. But pelvic exam at minimal, I think, is so important. Of course, in my office, I make sure patient is emptying adequately, so I get a bladder scan. But if you don't have a bladder scanner, a really accurate way to obtain urine and get the post for residual is doing a straight cat. So if patient is not having like active pain, because putting the catheter sometimes straight cat can be painful, but if patient can tolerate, it'll really give us an accurate way to measure what their true post for residual because even bladder scan can pick up ascites or other fluid and patient with the high BMI won't be as accurate. Mm -hmm. So um, not emptying bladder can lead to UTI. So straight cath will be almost like a diagnostic way to measure their post void and get a really clean urine. And this is a very simple question. When you say pelvic exam, you're talking, uh, I imagine inspection, you're doing a bimanual exam maybe. And are you also using a speculum to, to yeah, look that's like... That's a great question. If you don't have a speculum, just merely just looking to see if they have atrophic vaginitis, look, check for their labia, and then their pelvic floor. So, um, you know, I check the pelvic floor for tender points. So, um, obturator internus, levator ani, I document those four spots. I also check for their Kegel tone. I mean, I do all that because I, I did fellowship training, female mm -hmm. urology as well. But I, I check for those vaginal tissue and I do... Um, like pelvic exam with the digital exam to check for those muscles because if it's really tense, that could um, sometimes mimic um, overactive bladder symptoms or urinary tract symptoms. So when I push those muscles, it's really tense and painful. It could be due to pelvic floor dysfunction and those patients really benefit from pelvic floor physical therapy. So I tell them, hey, when I push on these muscles, does it reproduce? 
those urgency, frequency, um, burning, like pain, and they say yes, then then I give them like a I have a good news for you. Maybe mm. it's not from UTI, but it's pelvic floor dysfunction. I have fantastic pelvic floor physical therapist who can navigate this for you and actually help a lot of patients that way too. So fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. I'll go. So we're we <laughs> we started out with a patient who I probably would have treated over the phone the first time. <laughs> and, and now we're sort of checking, um, we're doing a full public examination in the office. So I guess the point that I'm making is that by the time the patient gets to you, I suspect we're trying to evaluate if there's something else that might predispose them to infection, right? Because right. I, you know, I, one time is coincidence, two times is happenstance, three times is enemy action or whatever the saying is. So like that first UTI, classic symptoms, I would probably just treat the patient empirically uh, and mea culpa. And then if they come back six weeks later, be like, maybe I guessed wrong and I should actually at least by the minimum do your analysis and send a culture off to make sure I chose the right antibiotic. And then say it happens again. And we're like, now this is weird. And now you're seeing the patient. My question for you after all that wind up is, I guess, what what sort of things should we be thinking about that might predispose someone to recurrent UTI? So you've touched on a lot of this stuff, but I, I guess what I'm asking is, sir, what's the difference between sort of complicated and uncomplicated? Because it looks like we're trying to suss out someone who's at risk for complicated UTIs, if I'm yes. understanding correctly. Uh, female patients tend to have shorter urethra, four centimeters, very close to the rectum. So they're more prone to UTI. So um, a lot of female patients will still be considered index patients. But if they had a previous history as a child, they had a urethral reflux. So they had to get a re-implant surgery or they had you know, some kind of urologic condition or some kind of surgery in the past. They had a sling place or they had a prolapse surgery. So if you get more information about their urological um, condition that can maybe uh, predispose them to more UTI, then I'll be more concerned that this could be something complicated. So just a lot of patients from the 80s and 90s got a lot of various gyne and urologic surgeries. So when you talk to them, they'll tell you, oh, I got a bladder tuck or I got this surgery. And then you get more out of it and you, you, you get a little more information that way too. What's a bladder tuck? It sounds cosmetic, but that can't be right. <laughs> no, it, yeah, it was more, 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 we, so I think it was like back in the day, it's just called one of the prolapse surgery, that name, I but I, you know, it sounds cosmetic, but it, that's how patients perceive and describe it as. It's the first I ever hear of that actually. Right. So I love that you said, asked about it. <laughs> So let's go back to this uh, this patient, our our thirty three year old with her second UTI in in the past um, six weeks, and we said we were going to give we were going to send a urinalysis and urine culture just to make sure it's a UTI and that we're not missing resistant bacteria. Do you have uh, favorite antibiotics that you use? Do you just follow the um, the AUA guideline? Yeah, um, what... yeah, I try to do the AUA guidelines too, and. It kind of depends on like patient's age, their comorbidity. So if patient is otherwise healthy and young, and I'm not worried about their pulmonary function, I'm okay with nitrofantoin. And, you know, I think a lot of our UTI tells that if you treat it, it should be less than seven days. So shorter course is good. You know, you know, augment and Keflex, depending on the, you know, uh, sensitivity and the local mm -hmm. antibody resistance pattern. But for a lot of elderly patients, macro or nat natriferin toy may not be a good option for the pulmonary fibrosis risk. Mm -hmm. So um, I like on those patients, if they can tolerate Augmentin or Keflex. Bactrim might get a little more concerned because of uh, sulfa. A lot of people cannot tolerate the sulfa part, but sometimes that's necessary. Coin alone, we're all more careful too. So yeah, so those are mm -hmm. kind of initial antibiotics. So the IDSA guidelines, the first line agents are trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole, which could be Bactrim in, in some cases, nitrofurantoin, one of the brands for that would, could, could be called Macrobid, and then phosphomycin, which is the other one, which I don't know what the brand name for that is, but that one is, it's a powder and it's a, it's a one-time dose. And it tends to be, depending on where you practice, sometimes more expensive. And also, Kellen, I've seen infectious diseases sort of reserve that one for people with quinolone resistance. I'm not sure if that's a practice everywhere, but do you have any comments about that one? Yeah, I've, we had ID doctors say kind of similar thing during residency too, but it was good to have kind of like different way we can go for quinolone resistant um, bacteria. But like you said, Matt, um, there is cost issue on certain part of mm -hmm. the country. So I think where I practice, uh, cost was an issue too. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, when, 
Paul, when we were in residency, I think everybody with a COPD exacerbation or a cystitis or bronchitis was getting quinolones. And then there was literally a black box like warning on 2016 or something like that. So it was during the time we were doing the podcast because I remember learning it on the podcast <laughs> that uh, quinolone should not be used for those things anymore. And I was like, oh, that's... We, I have done a lot of bad things in my life. The wild abandon that we prescribe superfloxacin with is just jaw dropping in retrospect. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It was and like now, candy. Yeah. <laughs> and now there's the, resi you know, the resistance problem anyway. So I, I mean, uh, but, but fortunately it seems like, um, with, with nitrofurin toin, uh, it's pretty well tolerated and there's not a lot of resistance to it, which is, even though it's been around for a really long time, at least not that I've seen. And the interesting thing is, is like. Like it stays mostly locally in the the urine, which is weird because it doesn't have systemic side effect, but you still have the pulmonary fibrosis risk mm. too. But also, it won't be a good option for like systemic, you know, if they have fever things like that because it's mm -hmm. that bactericidal is bacterial static. So you know, gotta be mindful of that too. Mm -hmm. But I think it does a nice job still for those simple. Right. You know, like we're when we're talking about these fr frontline antibiotics, we're talking about people that don't have. Uh, crazy urinary tract abnormalities and certainly are not like systemically ill with fevers right. and sepsis and things like that. Okay. That is correct. Yes. All right. That's actually pretty huge because I think I just, I don't want to say, I don't mean this like that. I just throw nat nitrofurotoin at all UTIs. I, I don't say that. I don't mean, mean to say throw, but it's like my first one, my first, my go-to. Um, I always forget uh, a trim sulfa as well because I'm always I'm always aware that I'm going to get somebody who's got an allergic reaction. Um, but yeah, so systemic symptoms, very key. If a patient has systemic symptoms, avoid nitrofurotoin and then just, of course, you're going to call out, send it for culture, but also consider something different. That's right. um, so let's say it's maybe uh, we had a positive culture, it was E. coli, um, for and now this we we were able to chase down the one from urgent care for this patient. So now we have two positive cultures, and then another month later she comes back with another urinary tract infection, and now she's just like asking, "I need something, you know, I can't keep dealing with this." Let's say the year before, maybe she even had two. So it's someone we're thinking about starting an anti antibiotic prophylaxis or something else for. How wh how does that conversation go for you, Kellen? Yeah. Um... I know uh, prophylactic antibiotic is an option too, but those young patients and they want to get pregnant or some other issues, I think I really try to get handle of it before I put it on suppressive dose. I mean, worse comes worse, you know, that's what we have to do. But I try to really counsel them on other things they can do, such as um, the guideline briefly talks about it too. And I've seen several studies talking about it, but drinking 1.5 liter of fluid has shown to decrease UTI. So um, 1.5 liter, you know, this is like a liter. So the cup that I carry, I show the patient visually, <laughs> this is a liter, it's a liter and a half at minimum does seem to help. And then this is more, it's not a guideline per se, but if you think about the bladder bowel dysfunction, which that's how we tackle uh, children with UTI. If children has a bilateral or unilateral urinary reflux and they're more prone to urinary tract infection and pyelonephritis, one of the things we treat is constipation because bladder bowel dysfunction lead to um, constipation leading to uh, more UTIs and especially on the female patients with those short urethra, four centimeter mm -hmm. proximity to rectum. A lot of them, I kind of give them idea like it's not anything you're doing. We're just engineered that way. So we don't have a separate separation from the rest of the rectum and the urethra. So w uh, women are more prone to uh, UTIs. So I try, try to reassure them, you're doing everything right. It's not you. You're not, you know, you're doing your best. So um, I try to talk about their bowel function. So Isabel and I, we talked about it last week, but the Bristol. So, you know, I'm a urologist, but why do I talk about bowel and what kind of poop you have? And they look at me like, why are you talking about like, I thought you're a urologist. But the thing is, if you cannot poo, you cannot pee is what I tell them, right? So, you know, for women, we have, you know, uterus, but for men, they have rectum and bladder. So if their uh, rectum is like pushing because they have so much bowel content, right? And then on my on female patient, we'll have rectum, uterus, and bladder. So you're competing for so much space in that pelvis. So I tell them, if you have so much bowel, that's just like more status, you know, more risk for infection. Your E. coli is the most common cause of UTI anyways, and they come from your poop. So I tell them, you got to have a soft, <laughs> I'm so like detail-oriented when it comes to bowel. 
Because if I tell them, do you have a Bristol three or four? They're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I'm like, do you have a poop that looks like sausage or banana that looks soft that sinks to the toilet? They're like, uh, no. Well, then that's what you need to work on. How do I do that? <laughs> you got to drink water and high fiber. So I, I start looking at fiber diet, you know. But when I tell these things, even my elderly patients, when I see them back, I'm like, doc, you're the best. All my problem got fixed. I'm like, no, it's you. I didn't do anything. You just listened to my advice. You're drinking more water, fluid. You're having more fiber. You're having more bowel movement. So it's like the happiest visit when I see them next, right? So this is I great news first. because, Paul, I think we can handle this kind of thing. We've uh, <laughs> we can do it. <laughs> one thing the residency taught me is how to make someone poop. I, I may not have learned much else. But. No, no, but it's funny how, I mean, we talked about this offline, uh, Kellen and I, how I had a patient who presented with UTI symptoms. We've went through the whole workup and it was actually her diverticulitis. Hmm. Uh, she ended up having, so it's a, so that it's such a small area that's, it's a, it's a golden and important, a small amount of real estate mm -hmm. there. So, yeah, yes. I love that. Uh, I, I think now is a, a, a reasonable time to talk about like cranberry, D mannose, methenamine, hippurate. I mean, those things are out there. I've seen, you know, articles mentioning them, but then at the same time, the articles mention that, you know, a bunch of negative trials and then some vaguely positive trials. So how do you talk to people about those kind of things? Yeah, I talk about this a lot too. And if the patients are, say, doing drinking fluid, they're having bowel movement every day, they're doing all the right things, and yet they're having this and they don't want to try like suppressive antibiotic. And I say, there is data. It's just not as strong or not as strong powered. But, you know, the D-manos or, you know, the cranberry supplement that does help you uh, prevent from those bacteria adhering to the urethelium. And they feel empowered and they're like, I feel great and they can afford it. I tell them, we don't know exactly how much those how often, but because so many studies did different dosing and such but if it helps you know there are science behind this so if you want to give it a try i said that sure but i don't like necessarily encourage them or discourage them but a lot of them are just give ask for advice and i basically say there you know there's no one brand that works the best so whatever you can find locally that you can mm -hmm. afford that you seem to like uh, i do say that instead of cranberry juice like cranberry pills or demand might be better because you know the juice itself has a lot of sugar content a lot of yes, my patients please. have diabetes right you don't need more diabetes exactly we don't need more diabetes and it can be irritating <laughs> to the bladder so i try to tell them take pills that i tell with confidence <laughs> okay and the, the the last one was methenamine hippurate which right. is um you know, I, I read that that has, there has to be a certain pH, right. that, you know, for that to be active, uh, yes. it has to be more of an acidic. Is that, is that one that you've used or that you've read? Yeah. About? Yeah. I, I did read a lot of supplement on various things and I think all the data are kind of inconclusive. So, um, I tend to be like, if you want to give it a try, already have it, you bought it, you know, but I, I just use it with grain of salt and make sure you're not spending so much and cost, you know, a lot of my patients need to be uh, financially, you know, kind of looking into those things too. So, yeah, the trial that I saw with methenamine hippurate was actually relatively recent. And Paul, it had a good name, the ALTER trial. It was looking at methenamine hippurate versus like daily antibiotic prophylaxis. And it was found to be non-inferior, but definitely a lot of problems with the study, you know, uh, as far as number of patients and things like that and some dropout. So, you know, it wasn't super convincing to me that I should be putting everyone on that. But it's good to know that for the most part, you know, these things are things we can offer if or if patients are already looking these up and coming in wanting to try them, it's reasonable for them to try them. Um, okay, so should we go on, uh, Isabel, to the next case? Let's let's say we we decided our patient actually, we just told her she hydrated. She actually had been really constipated. That fixed her problem. So happy ending for our first case. And she, it's been at least a year without a UTI. So let, let's go on to the second one. Sure. Uh, now we have a 50 year old woman in postmenopause. Uh, this is Miss Bethany. Miss Bethany uh, has uh, type 2 diabetes, the medical condition of obesity, a history of breast cancer, and she's currently on tamoxifen. Uh, she presents for follow up after a three day hospitalization following an episode of pyelonephritis. And she reports that her only symptoms were nausea. She had mild fevers and she said a weird belly pain. That's all she had, but no urinary frequency, urgency, or dysuria. And she reports having had three UTIs in the last year. So this one's a little different, a little more complicated, right? 
um, already. Um, what challenges do you see in this patient that we as PCP should be aware of as soon as we see this in our in our clinic? I think this patient may be more challenging because it's not like she had breast cancer several years ago. I think she's actively getting treated. So she may be, you know, immunocompromised, but also for per uh, perimenopausal ladies, we do tend to offer vaginal estrogen cream because it, that has strong data to help. So that conversation may have to be with her oncologist and, you know, patient and risk and benefit. But a lot of patients who had previous breast cancer that they were treated, um, I think there are several recent studies to us outside the U.S. and, you know, a lot of study looking to it that even with the patient with the breast cancer history, the vaginal estrogen cream itself did not necessarily increase the risk. But patients still gets very anxious about it, too. So um, it's really about, you know, the conversation and sometimes even getting their oncologist involved because a lot of our oncology uh, colleagues are on top of this, you know, and it really helps. Right. Because the UTI can lead to so many ultramental status and, you know, really poor quality of life and they get admitted and get pilo that affects their renal function. So really, patients need to look at the whole picture of risk and benefit. But thankfully, the vaginal estrogen cream, um, that has shown to stay local. So it does such a nice job locally kind of changing those pH. So in case anybody's wondering, like, how does the vaginal estrogen cream work? It lowers the pH like it should be where patients are not menopausal or perimenopausal. So pH goes down and good bacteria that used to reside there, lactobacillus, they grow. Right. So the lactobacillus goes up. So the bad bacteria, usually from the rectum, E. coli, things like that, has no place to stay. So it's like fighting. Right. So uh, it, and then, of course, it helps you with vaginal dryness and you know, pelvic pain or sex with pain. So vaginal estrogen cream is so great in that sense. But with this case, with the active breast cancer, I can already tell a lot of patients will be anxious about it. So really, I think getting oncologists involved and talk about risk benefit um, and then just having that honest conversation. Um, in this case, maybe I may even consider uh, prophylactic antibiotic as well, because I actually do have several patients who's getting um, chemotherapy for various reasons. And for a short period of time, I do put them on some prophylactic antibiotic because they can already tell. Or patient with MS, I have a lot of patients, I take care of a lot of MS patients. And when they're on certain immunosuppressant, or rheumatoid arthritis and immunosuppressant, they tend to get UTI, like they can tell when they're on immunosuppressant, they get a UTI. So sometimes I put them on prophylactic antibiotic as well. So I guess I do see a lot of recurring UTI patients with various. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I love that you talked about these patients who have the immunocompromised patient, the patient with the vaginal dryness, the chemo patients, because these are the ones that show up and they're the ones that are going to get that UTI that's going to end up in the hospital, just like right. her. And here we can do something to prevent it. Um, and I, I love also how you said about um, talking to your uh, your oncologist. That's what exactly what happened what I did in clinic. I just messaged the oncologist while the patient was in front of me, like, let's ask him because you might be able to do this vaginal cream. And they uh, they they need that reassurance also from them. Uh, Kellen, I just wanted to bring up one study that I found when I was reviewing for this today related to the vaginal estrogen. And I, I wasn't sure how much weight people are putting on this, but this this came up. Uh, it was by Agrawal, and it came out in 2023. And it, they were basically looking at like vaginal estrogen for genino-urinary syndrome of menopause in women with a history of breast cancer. And they found that the main conclusion of the study was that over five years, there was no increased recurrence, which is consistent with like everything, you know, what the guidelines say and everything. But they the subgroup analysis in this uh, subgroup analysis, women that were on aromatase inhibitors apparently did have an increased recurrence. And at least one of the sources was saying like, just be careful, you know, those women maybe don't put them on vaginal estrogen. I, I had never heard of it. And it went so counter to all this stuff that was just like vaginal estrogen is fine. Cause we, we recently did a hormone therapy episode too. And this study had at the time hadn't even been around. So I'm not sure how much of a big trial this was or how important this was thought to be. Yeah. And with those specific subtype of patient, more the reason getting oncology on board mm -hmm. can give us because, you know, we know that it's safe on, you know, majority of patients. But if there's any specific concern for sub, you know, subtypes, then I think always asking will be mm -hmm. a good place. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's tough, but it, it does help vaginal estrogen cream. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, Paul, you're America's primary care doctor, so I'm I'm sure you're you're in close contact with the oncologist before you're starting vaginal estrogen anyway in in folks. But no, and I I think Isabel's point's well taken. The patients are often anxious and don't want to do anything that might even have the WAP to the possibility of recurrence. So I think just getting them mm-hmm. just to kind of get their blessing, especially since it's no medication is entirely benign, no matter how much we'd like it to be. I, I, I do think it's worth reaching out. Mm-hmm. And uh, Kellen, f- for talking about like the prophylactic antibiotics, just to get back to that, I mean, the ones the ones mentioned in the guidelines, as we kind of talked about, trim sulfa, nitrofurantoin, you mentioned cephalexin, and we talked about phosphomycin. When, when giving those antibiotics, is your preference to give them uh, daily prophylaxis or do you let some people do postcoital prophylaxis? And how do you sort of choose between the two? Or the, I guess the other co- option is the self-start where they can sort of just sort of decide if they think they have a UTI and then they can start on their own. Can you talk about that a little bit, the, the three different options? Yeah, I don't think I do postcoital as much as I thought because a lot of my patients, when I ask them, they tell me they're not necessarily related to intercourse. So it was hard for me to be like, okay, if you really think they're not related. So I tend to do the prophylaxis. Self-starting, I get a little more cautious because A, I often think it's not a UTI, <laughs> some of my anxious <laughs> patients. So I'm like pelvic floor physical therapy. But um, I do, <laughs> so pelvic exam and then reassurance a lot of time. But self-starting, I do if patients are really reliable and they don't have other concerns like that for multi-resistant bugs. But most of the time, what I do is I do suppressive dose and try it out. And in my practice, I tell them it's like my last resort mm-hmm. because I want to try this, this, this. And then because if I don't want to just do that and then there's nothing that I can do to add more to their treatment plan. So I usually do three months and I usually I'm so thankful we have telehealth. That's one of the things that really helps us after the pandemic that we can utilize telehealth. So I had to telehealth in three months or so after starting um, suppressive dose. I'm like, hey, how are you doing? And you can tell when I call, they're like, this is the best thing ever. So like if they're doing so well and they're getting through those difficult winter months and things like that, because it can get cold in Kentucky, you know? So <laughs> they're happy. I'm happy. You're happy. Let's not any rock any bow. Let's not change anything at this time. Reassess in the spring. So in a couple like months, I'm like, hey, you still want to be on it? We're slowly wean off. So sometimes I can successfully wean off in like three to six months. I try to eventually wean off within a year if I can, because I think the guideline talked about it too. Okay, perfect. Now, I think I always struggle with trying to determine if and when I need to do imaging for some patients, like figuring out what's warranted. So you're, you're counseling me, your primary care provider office downstairs. That's where I am. What would you tell me to do How, and as far as the testing that we could do, or do I just send them to you? Yeah. So if the patient had previous, um, like kidney stone history, flank pain, blood and urine, and, um, you're concerned about some kind of structural reason for their blood or the, the UTIs, then, you know, just starting with, you know, renal ultrasound should be okay. But if they are a smoker and they actually had gross hematuria and you're concerned that, you know, a CT urogram will be a better option. But if you're not 100% sure on exactly what imaging to order, like I don't mind and like a primary team reaching out to me or I don't mind just ordering myself. But it has a lot to do with their history and physical too. But I'll definitely look into any blood and urine and their previous history. And, you know, certain recurring UTI like uh, proteas that can cause staghorn calculus. So that'll be more concerning. So if there's any concern for like those large staghorn calculus, you know, starting with ultrasound should be fine and that you can order casket if necessary. But oftentimes the index patient, you don't need to do upper track imaging, but usually it's some other concerning facts like, oh yeah, everybody in my, f-. I always ask, even if you come to me for like routine, other things, um, I ask, hey, anybody in the family had any kind of bladder cancer or kidney cancer? So I just ask that off the bat because you get a lot of information. <laughs> Here lately, I've, I've been having a lot of Lynch syndrome patients who just come to see me uh, for prophylactically, just making sure everybody had this and I want to make sure. So uh, I guess I get a lot of complicated patients. I rarely get index patients. So for me, this question is kind of hard because who is actually index patient in my practice, <laughs> right? So if they do have concern and they come see me, then I do upper track imaging. Usually like ultrasound is fine for a starter, but if they're heavy smoker and they're blood and urine, you probably need to get CT urogram 
with the contrast and delay imaging to make sure there is any kind of upper tract urothelial cell carcinoma finding, which we found in the past. And then uh, cystoscopy. Not everybody needs to be scoped. That's what the guideline says. Not everybody, especially index patient, they don't need to. But if they had previous, you know, blood in urine or any kind of urologic surgery, some of them had, you know, urethra surgeries or slings, then I need to make sure they don't have any kind of erosion to their bladder, bladder stones. I know we're talking about female patient, but male patient can have large prostate and that can lead to bladder outlet obstruction, incomplete bladder ending, trabeculation. So a uh, female patient can have trabeculation as well. So cystoscopy, very valuable um, information. I did have like a younger patient that had unexplained recurring UTI and finally, after conservative ways and things like that, we ended. I ended up scoping, and there was pretty significant diverticulum in the bladder that kept accumulating urine. So that was one of the reasons, and it was. And in that case, it did help. Yeah. I can I ask a follow up to the CT urogram. So let's say we don't work in a tertiary center right. that has the has access to that. Um, what would some of our audiences then order? The like CT with contrast or any specifics? Um, CT, well, maybe if you just want to start with the ultrasound and I can sort it out for you. Cause I hate it when patients get the wrong CAT scan and mm -hmm. I have to order it again, then they have to pay out of pocket again, or it won't be covered. So when in doubt, just maybe start because a lot of insurance companies like will ask you to order non-invasive one first. And then like, if they don't have a risk factors, sometimes you have to order ultrasound anyways. So if you're kind of wondering, like, should I order CT urogram and do I have resources, then just I'm happy to just do it, you know, and order it once. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just to clarify, when you were you were mentioning index patient for the audience, we talked about that. That was kind of our first case, like a young right. person, no young immunocompromised, person. no anatomic abnormalities that we think are causing the recurrent UTI. So you That's don't have right. to just for that patient, you don't have to jump right to imaging nope. or cystoscopy. Nope, not at those. Yeah, great, and great point. What about if, um, if offline you mentioned maybe ureoplasma, mycoplasma, some of the DNA or PCR right. testing? When do you, who do you think about ordering that for? Yeah, so especially kind of younger patient that they really do have a UTI like symptom, but traditional culture doesn't grow. Um, sometimes if your lab has it, you can ask for atypicals and they'll grow it for you. But I've also had a situation where you order atypical, but the lab thought we wanted TB tests. <laughs> We're like, uh, I mean, technically you can get sterile pyuria from GUTB, but that's not what I was looking for. So there are a lot of um, other commercial companies that does, you know, DNA or PCR tests, and they don't have to take as long time to get those urine culture. Only caution is sometimes they get too many bacteria result. So they'll even get lactobacillus or good bacteria that we don't really care about. So that I don't want to go down that hole and patients are like, well, this bacteria is here. That's You want that lactobacillus. So um, you have to use it with caution, but I've seen sometimes in select cases, the traditional culture didn't show, but it was, you know, mycoplasma or things like that, that right. did help patients. Yeah. And, but I have and, to imagine in those instances, you have a quote unquote positive urinalysis, right? You're going to see leukocytesterase or you might even see some RBC. So this would be the case where you'd have sort of a, a culture negative urinalysis that still looks for all the world like UTI. Am I understanding this correctly? That That's is the correct. Would get that. Absolutely. So let me throw a different patient at you. The patient who has the urinary symptoms and you're waiting and excited for that urinalysis to come back and then it comes back not super compelling. So maybe you see, you can get the dipstick. So you send the urine out to the lab, it comes back even less compelling. Like maybe there's a couple of whites, but like otherwise nothing that kind of screams UTI. And this, and this happens repeatedly. Like, so I, I have, I feel like I've had a million patients like this. So can you talk me through sort of your differential and what the illness script might look for, for causes of urinary symptoms that are maybe not necessarily infectious or at least related to like simple cystitis? Right. I know we talked about pelvic floor dysfunction a lot, but when women have, um, especially one of the risk factors is having childbirth with greater than eight pound baby that can lead to pelvic floor dysfunction and sometimes pelvic organ prolapse. So I always get their uh, OB history and what was the largest baby was there some kind of birth trauma. So you have to get uh, more procedure during the um, birthing. So if they had those kind of concerns, I obviously the pelvic exam to check for prolapse. If they have previous hysterectomy, you know, several years later, they may have some component of prolapse, pelvic organ prolapse. So I check for that. Um, sometimes patients can tell, but the pelvic organ prolapse patient will have like a sensation that they're sitting on a golf ball or some kind of ball between their legs. 
or they'll tell you, hey, doc, like at the end of the day, when I've been on my feet a lot, when I have to pee, I have to push, I have to use my finger to push to get my ball back to, you know, you know, your vagina, then that's called splinting. You know how you splint your bone, but, um, you know, those prolapse patients, we call that that splinting. So those patients can be having that issues, pelvic organ prolapse, pelvic floor dysfunction, and also patients with painful bladder syndrome too. So, you know, traditionally, you know, uh, you may have heard of the term interstitial cystitis, but not everybody fit to that. But if they have a lot of pel- painful bladder syndrome and their pain is relieved when their bladder is empty, and a lot of them may have completely normal culture, but really have dysuria and pain and UTI-like symptom. Sometimes, you know, it could be due to painful bladder syndrome. And with those, a lot of them also benefit from pelvic organ, or sorry, uh, pelvic floor physical therapy as well. But not all of them who scope uh, to look for interstitial cystitis will have what we call Hunter's ulcer, which is like those really ulcerated red spot. Uh, only a few patients actually have that. So interstitial cystitis, as we know from, you know, me teaching is like diagnosis of the exclusion. So you have to rule out a lot of different things. So um, that can definitely be one of the reasons they could have a UTI symptoms, um, but it's not. And just overactive bladder symptoms sometimes can be, pre- you know, urgency frequency this year, not so much, but sometimes there are some overlap and incontinence. Some people say that they have a lot of incontinence when they think they have a UTI, but it's actually just overactive, urgent incontinence. And I think there was one more we earlier talked about. urinary syndrome? Oh, yes. That's, that's exactly. You read my mind, Matt. So general urinary syndrome. So a lot of menopause patients can have symptoms like they're having a UTI. And of course, on that case, vaginal est- estrogen cream will be your best friend. So with those, with the patient's genitourinary syndrome and menopause, is that diagnosis like, you know, but I guess part of it by exam, there might be vaginal atrophy or irritation. Yeah. And then what sort of symptoms do you most commonly see for patients with that? Yeah, I think those atrophic vaginitis, so vaginal dryness too. So definitely need a uh, pelvic exam for that. And there are a lot of overlaps and patients will kind of tell like around the age that they were uh perimenopausal, a lot of their urinary symptom happened too. Mm-hmm. So you kind of know it was around their menopausal state that this got worse because mm-hmm. before that they weren't having issues like this. So it's, it's a lot about their history and they're also physical too. All right. So the history for the general urinary syndrome of menopause, it's about the history, my complaint of dryness, um, and and then the exam is very important for bladder pain syndrome. That's people that have pain relieved by emptying their bladder and you're not going to see those classic like hunters lesions or ulcers uh, on everybody when you do cystoscopy and it's a diagnosis of exclusion that's right okay and then it, it could also just be overactive bladder you said and we should ask people about i haven't had anyone report this to me though i've never asked this sensation of sitting on a golf ball or having to do splinting um you know at the if they've been on their feet all the time at right. the end of the day so Definitely, we'll be asking about some of those things, and then I, Paul, had you heard about this? The large child over eight pounds. I, I wouldn't have thought to ask. <laughs> no, that I will now be incorporating that into my history. So thank yeah. you. Yeah, so that's really helpful. So I guess the last thing we've mentioned pelvic floor dysfunction, with, like for with pelvic physical therapy, what sort of things are they doing, um, and what you know, what should we tell the patient to expect? Yeah, it's very fantastic. So. Pelvic floor physical therapists, um, like when you like break your arm or you get a new hip and you get physical therapy, pelvic floor physical therapists will specifically, you know, those points, the tender points I mentioned, the obturator mm-hmm. internus, levator ani, and they do a very in-depth, you know, pelvic floor muscle. They check for Kegel tone and they basically um, kind of empower the patients on the goal. So I've noticed when I get the report on Oh, how the therapy is going, there's usually like a goal they want to set. Say if they have urgency frequency, urgent continence, or pelvic pain, then they'll have before and after goal. So they're like, in three months, I want this this goal to be 50% improved. And when they are, then they're discharged from their clinic. But till then, they get homework. So they they go to the sessions. I, I, I believe the first session is a lot of just getting, you know, history and physical. So they do like very extensive diagnosis and check for all those tender spots. And then every session, you know, they work on specific areas and give patients homework. So 
what I do is when I send the patient to a physical therapist, a pelvic floor physical therapist, I reassess in a couple of months and ask them. And a lot of them tell them that going that and doing the homework at home, they really got better. And quite a few UTI patients for like, maybe it's a vicious cycle, but you know, they'll get a UTI, they trigger pelvic pain and pelvic floor dysfunction. And then yeah, pelvic floor dysfunction feels like a UTI. So it's like a vicious cycle, but the cycle is broken, which I'm very thankful. I love my pelvic floor physical therapist. <laughs> <laughs> That's, you're not the first guest to tell us that about their pelvic therapist, um, Isabel. So I'm hesitant on how to ask this question because patients have asked me with the same hesitancy about those uh, to those exercise, uh, Kegel exercisers that are, have you had any experience with those? And yes. are they, I, I'm always hesitant to tell them, yes, go for it, because I don't know if there's science behind it. I'd rather, of course, encourage them to do Great question. Now, if you do Kegel exercise right, it'll help you with the stress incontinence. But I've had a lot of anxious patients who want to be ahead of their pelvic floor health and they overdo it and they end up with a pelvic floor dysfunction and overactive bladder, urgency, frequency, and dysuria. So I have to teach them, oh no. And, uh, and a lot of times they do it wrong. So the muscle you squeeze that you're trying not to fart in public is the, the proper Kegel exercise I tell them. I mean, we're kind of making it really simple for the patients, but you know, they seem to understand. So when I do pelvic exam, I actually teach them Kegel exercise. And a lot of time they'll like use their belly. I'm like, you're not doing it right. And this could actually make things worse. And you have belly cramps and belly pain. So I like try to teach them the proper Kegel. But overdoing Kegel can lead to pelvic floor dysfunction to it. They just always tense, you know. That's why you got to involve the professionals, Paul. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, this is this has been so fantastic. And I think we we have to ask you for take home points now, but it's been super helpful. So if you had like a couple take home points that you wanted the audience to remember from this discussion, what would those be? It's not always a UTI. So like I kind of emphasize poor bladder gets all the blame. My my attending that I respect used to say bladder is just innocent bystanders. There's not much it can do. It holds urine and it pees when you tell you to, but Otherwise, you know, it's just innocent bystander. So really, really talk about patient's bowel. If they cannot poo, they cannot pee. And do not be scared of vaginal estrogen cream. And if you're scared, look at more data or talk to oncologists or just talk to your patients about it. But vaginal estrogen cream really does help. Tell the patients. Um, actually, somebody I respect actually said that. It's not just enough to be nice, but you got to be kind. I mean, like, you have to be nice to your patient, but sometimes when you hear them why they don't want to hear, that might not be the nicest thing, but that's a kind thing to do. So I tell my patients, you're going to hate me, but I'm going to tell you stuff you may not want to do. You tell me you hate water, but I'm telling you water is helpful and, you know, Coke drinking and all this can lead to diabetes. So, yeah, it is fluid, but I prefer water with lemon is your best friend <laughs> and you got to poop and fiber. So a lot of times I feel like I'm kind of nagging and like, you know, trying to teach, but I'm like, I'm here to tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. Are you still going to come back for my next visit? And they all laugh. Like I try to make my patients laugh, but try to be realistic. Like guys, it's like you do your part. I do my part and you're going to get better. You will get better. I think a lot of patients feel so hopeless. So I tell them like, you will get better, but you have to do your homework. I actually tell them homework. I have a four-year-old daughter. She calls me a bladder teacher. So I've been using that term for my patients. I'm your bladder teacher, okay? So you will get better, but you gotta do your homework too. And they're like, okay. <laughs>
Stuart Brigham composed our theme music. Chris the Chew Manchu was on Discord. Jen Wada was on our Patreon. I think I got everyone there. And uh, until next time, Paul, with all that, I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Wada. I am your PA, Isabel Valdez. And as always, remain Dr. Paul Nelson Williams. Thank you and goodbye. 